about five years ago, I heard a story that triggered me quite a lot and eventually opened new doors for me. It's a simple story about a man with a very long beard, right? Just like this. He took pride in having a long, beautiful beard and enjoyed having it until one day somebody asked him, when you're sleeping, are you keeping your beard under the blanket or on the blanket? I guess some of you already are guessing how this story is going to develop. So he said that he never thought about it and just continued on his way. But later that night, before he was about to fall asleep, he, th he thought about it. First, he saw that the beard was on the blanket, so he told himself, apparently, I sleep this way. Well, after five minutes, it started getting cold and uncomfortable, so he decided to put it back under the blanket. Well, guess what? After five minutes, it gets too hot and sweaty and itchy, and so he decides to put it back on the blanket, and then again under the blanket, and then again on the blanket. And the poor man just cannot sleep for the next couple of months. Something that was not a problem before he even considered thinking about it becomes a problem after he does. When I heard his story, um, I was a law student in Sweden, and as a law student, your brain is kind of being programmed to look for trouble. So you're supposed to think about how things can go wrong. It's good. And when I heard it, I started realizing that I had a similar type of problems that I now call beard problems. Beard problems are situations when our attempt to solve the problem is the problem. In other words, when we're not trying to solve them, it's not as if we are ignoring something that requires our active interference, but we're simply not creating a problem. For example, at that point, I was very actively thinking whether I was going to come back to Armenia or live in Sweden or live somewhere else. Obviously, I didn't have any answer, but I didn't need to have an answer either. So it was only a problem when I was thinking about it. Now, the problem consisted of a thought. In this case, it's, it was the repetitive thought that I needed to notice. And when I was trying to solve it, the means that I was using to solve the problem consisted of the same material as the problem itself. And obviously, I couldn't solve it. So it was like ex trying to extinguish some fire with fire. When I started realizing this concept, um, it became obvious to me that the less beard problems I try to solve, the more energy, creativity, and clarity I can have to concentrate on real problems or to do things that I, didn't even, that I didn't even think I could do. And this is a universal thing. The less noise I have inside my head, the more dynamic and active I can be in the real world outside me. The less I do what's not up to me, the more I can do what is up to me. And believe me, every day I'm meeting many people that are trying to solve different beard problems. And I'm seeing new thought patterns in me that are completely unnecessary. We tend to make ourselves busy in our heads, and this creates an illusion as if you're busy doing something meaningful. Now, there's another type of beard problems that I like, and I call them posy beard problems or beard-like problems. Let's do a quick experiment to see if anybody in the audience can relate to this. I want you to raise your hand if you ever needed to solve an actual problem. Let's say make a decision, find the keys that you lost, remember the password you forgot, doesn't matter, but it's an actual problem. But the harder you thought about it, the further away you got from the answer. Can anybody relate to this? Fantastic. And this means that even if the problem at hand is more real or substantial, putting more mental efforts doesn't mean getting more results. How about the other way around? Have you ever had an experience of finding a great solution when you were not thinking about whatever it is that you needed to solve whatsoever? Maybe you were out walking with the dog or in the shower. Has anybody experienced that? Great. And this means that the excessive mental efforts not only do not help us, but sometimes, sometimes they get on the way of new insights and ideas. And this is, this is known. The greatest academic insights, the most revolutionary business ideas, they were born when somebody had a quiet, still mind. And in that moment, in his or her consciousness, there was a space for a whole new thought. And most of us know this. So why are we still inclined to think harder when it doesn't help us or to think when it doesn't serve us at all? And this is one of the questions that over the past five years has taken me to the world of so-called three principles coaching or transformative coaching. This is not something I can address in a very short amount of time, but I want to demonstrate a direction that will allow you to see more and more every time you take it. George Gurdjieff, one of the greatest Armenian mystics who dedicated most of his life to exploring the deepest levels of mind and thought, formulates a really beautiful thought in a book called The Fourth Way. He writes, 
The only prison you can never escape is the one you don't see. Well, he's a mystic. He speaks in, in a language of metaphors. He means that you can never solve a problem if you have identified it. And in his metaphoric language, he also describes how you can never escape from these prisons on your own, and you need other people to see that you're in a prison. Right? There's an old saying about this. I don't know who discovered water, but I'm pretty sure it's not fish. If something surrounds you all the time, it's really hard to notice that. Right now, you probably notice me, the objects in this room, the people sitting next to you, but not the space in which everything is. But if you think about it, the space is so much bigger than what's in it. And that's why more and more people hire transformative coaches, because it's easier for them to see these mental prisons, as Gurdjieff puts it, that are otherwise invisible to the naked eye. And just like that, just like these mental prisons, starting from our childhood, we are given certain ideas and presumptions that drive us, but we're not always conscious or mindful of them, or being conscious of them, we have not really questioned whether they are true or not. And one of these ideas is that circumstances create feelings. In other words, this is the idea that our experience of life is created outside in. So our mind kind of works like a camera, and I'm taking a picture of whatever is happening outside me, and it's mirrored in me as a feeling. Right? And if this is true, it means there are good circumstances, meaning situations, people, doesn't matter where I'm supposed to feel good, and then there are bad circumstances where I'm supposed to feel bad. But is this actually true? Please raise your hands if you've ever been in a great circumstance and felt bad. How about the other way around? Have you ever been in a circumstance that's perceived to be bad and felt great? Okay. My father, who was a doctor in the Nagorno-Karabakh War, tells me that he used to meet people that were, during the war, that were, that were actually quite content and even seemed happy. And then he used to meet the same people after the war, and they were miserable. And this used to shock me. How is it even possible? But apparently, we are constantly dealing with a big mismatch between reality and perception. And we're also dealing with a diversity of perception, an instability of perception. Something that makes you feel good maybe makes you feel disgusted. If I feel great about something, maybe in five minutes it will turn upside down, even if that thing itself doesn't change at all. So our feelings seem to fluctuate much faster than the reality that we have associated with. And this is because circumstances don't create feelings. This is a false idea. One of the ways I realized that was by following the implications of this idea. If what I feel is the result of where I am and how I'm doing, then the only way to change how I feel is to improve my reality, right? So this becomes the formula that I'm gonna achieve some ha happiness through some form of success. I will be happy when I graduate, when I get a job, when I change my job, when I change my partner, when I change my country, you name it. But we, if you're honest with each other, we know that it never works this way. If we manage to get what we think we need to have, we might get a quick wave of good, positive emotions, but it is often replaced by the line of thoughts that, okay, now I need something else or something different. And as I said, I was not an exception from this rule, so I was chasing symbols of my happiness, whatever they were at different stages of my life. But whenever I was taking a step towards it, that thing was moving too. And that was the greatest thing that could ever happen to me. I like how Eckhart Tolle talks about this phenomenon, the author of Power of Now. He writes, Reality is not supposed to fulfill you. Perhaps it's supposed to frustrate you enough to look within. Well, I guess you could say that I was lucky enough to, to get frustrated early on. So at that point, I was, I was about 20 years old. I had a full scholarship from the government of Sweden. I was studying at one of the greatest Scandinavian universities, just like I wanted. It looked like I had everything that I needed. And I felt emptier than ever before. At that point, I had already realized that my thoughts probably had something to do with this process. So my idea was, all right, if, even if the reality makes me feel this way, I can use my thoughts to mitigate the effects of that. So even if my mind works like a camera, I can use my thoughts to control how I hold that camera. So it was all about meditating, trying to think more positively, trying to think less, and so forth, using every possible technique that could give me control. But if I'm entirely honest with you, none of them changed anything essential. Not because I wasn't trying hard enough, and certainly not because I didn't know how to, but just because all of them were still under the wrong premise. I was still in one of these mental prisons, as Gurdjieff puts it. 
And that was the prison of not knowing that the only place my feelings can ever, ever come from is my own thinking. In other words, my mind doesn't work like a camera. It works more like a projector. So I'm using my projector-like mind to project different things to different walls, meaning in different forms of reality and circumstances. But at the end, the picture, what's projected, meaning my feeling, comes from the projector, meaning from my thinking. I live in the feeling of my thinking, no matter I see that thought or not. Now, this is not something you're going to get by trying to figure it out or analyzing, and this is clearly not something that you have to believe in. But just because it's true, I guarantee you that you will see it when you look into this direction. Have you ever noticed that when you're angry, you're not just angry at somebody or something? When you're angry, if your mom calls you and tells you the sweetest and most positive things, even that is going to piss you off. Because in that moment, you're not experiencing what people are telling you. You're experiencing your thinking in the moment, and that's it. So this is one of the ideas behind the so-called three principles that was um, originally formulated by a Scottish, enlightened Scottish welder um, named Sidney Banks. So it's a simple idea that thoughts and feelings are two sides of the same coin, but the implications of this idea are massive. So let's go back to our beard problems and see if this can help us understand them better. Let's say you have to make a decision. If you're like most people, you gather a lot of information, maybe you create a list with pros and cons, and you ask for advice from a lot of people, and it's very likely that in this process, you're gonna get stuck. In a traditional model, the presumption is that we're feeling uncomfortable because we're in an uncertain situation, because we haven't yet made a decision. So making a decision becomes our way to address the problem. So I think I'm gonna make a decision, and this is gonna take me to a calm state of mind. Right? If I don't see the thought-feeling connection, this is the only option that's available to me. And of course, I'm going to be inclined to think harder so that I can make a decision as early as possible. But if I try to understand the meaning of my feelings, and if I think the same thoughts, even if they are repetitive or contradictory, and I feel bad, then I know that feeling is informing me about the fact that I have a low quality of thinking. Not about the necessity to make a decision, but about my inability to make a decision. If I live in the feeling of my thinking, then my feeling always informs me about the quality of my thoughts, what kind of state of mind I'm in, what kind of a movie I'm projecting. So if I see this, I automatically let go of the chain of thoughts that makes me feel uncomfortable. And any time I remove any unnecessary noise, what's left is silence. So I don't need to do anything to go back to a calm state of mind because calm state of mind is my home. It's the default. There is an ever-present, some sort of a self-cleaning mechanism installed in each and every one of us so the thoughts and feelings calm down on their own whenever we're letting it. So it should look more like this. We get back to a calm state of mind consciously, and then in that moment we get new thoughts because new thoughts want to come to us all the time so we get new thoughts and this, this allows us to take to arrive at a good decision so it's entirely the other way around the first model not only is based on the wrong premise but it's completely unnecessary remember that i said i can't you can't achieve happiness through success well in this example the success was the decision that i thought i needed to make so i can't achieve happiness through success but i can allow success to be a side effect of the happiness that I always get back to. Now let's break this down into a couple of different scenarios if, and see if we can understand them even better. A lot of people that talk to me and are stuck and can't make a decision, most of them already know what they want to do or what they should do, right? But they haven't realized it yet. So the answer is somewhere in there. And this is similar to having a bucket of dirty water with some sand in it, and underneath the bucket, something is already written. What I want is to be able to read this. And what I'm doing is I'm constantly shaking it. Well, the answer is obvious, I stop shaking it. But I do that when I see that I'm doing this. And feeling is that which allows me to see how much I'm shaking the bucket. When I understand the true meaning of my feelings, this takes me to the root of the problem, and I don't need to, I don't need to use any techniques. The nature has already designed it. The second group of people that I talk to don't yet know what they have to do, but they don't have to know, just like me, trying to solve a beard problem. Well, in that moment, they're feeling, they're thinking. 
And the feeling is informing them how close they are to the most efficient self on, the, on their mental level. And finally, the third group is people that are on the clock to make a decision, and they still don't know which option is better, uh, but they have to make a decision. So the necessity to make a decision outweighs, and they just pick one. And here again, the thought-feeling connection brings, brings an entirely new perspective. Right? Most of the people exaggerate the possibility that one situation can be better than the other one. So we think, all right, I, do I want to be in the circumstance A or B? Hmm, am I going to feel better in circumstance A or B? Well, guess what? There is no such thing as a feeling equivalent to a circumstance B or a feeling equivalent to a circumstance A. We don't know what we're going to be thinking in five seconds. We don't know what we're going to be thinking in five minutes. So how can we know what we're going to think in five minutes to be able to know what we're going to be feeling in five minutes? When I see this, I understand the independence of my well-being from the external circumstances of my life. And when we see this independence, then navigating through these external circumstances loses its seriousness and becomes just a fun game to play. We misinterpret what our, meanings, what our feelings are trying to tell us, and we're trying to change and manipulate them all the time. And in this race, if you will, we have become so afraid of them that we forgot that they exist for a reason, that we can cooperate with them, that they're designed to guide us back to our default state of well-being, clarity, and creativity. So I want to leave you with the words of Sidney Banks, the a very ordinary Scottish man who had an extraordinary experience and the knowledge that he gave to the world still affects thousands of people across the globe. If the only thing people learned was not to be afraid of their experience, that alone would change the world. Thank you.